Hi everyone, Wild Norwester here. I've had a few questions over the years about the way that towns and stations are laid out in my series So Do The Modern Years and So Do The Early Years. So, I've made this video to explain it. I'll start by covering the main line, then the branch lines, then the other railways on the island. Please note, these settings are being described as of the present day in So Do The Modern Years, immediately following the events of Adeline The Phantom Engine in 2012. When I first started making these videos, I was mostly familiar with the TV series, as that's what I'd grown up with. I had read some of the Railway series books, but I wasn't really aware of the differences between them and the TV series, in terms of geography. So when I downloaded the Sodor Island 3D Island of Sodor route for trains, I thought that that was how the stations were supposed to be laid out. By the time I learned the difference, it was too late to change it. As such, I've stuck with this TV series layout for the stations at this end of the line in order to maintain continuity. However, I have made one or two tweaks to the railway facilities surrounding Mapford itself. The biggest of these is the harbour just down from the station. In the TV series, this big harbour is located at Brendam. To me, this never made much sense. This is the biggest harbour on Sodor, with cruise ships, cargo ships, tugboats, and so on, arriving, departing, and moving about. Yet, it is at the far end of a branch line run by just two engines, Edward and Boko. Furthermore, the story Wrong Road clearly establishes that this branch line cannot regularly support the weight of mainline engines such as Gordon. As such, I decided to move the big harbour to Knapford. It's located next to the main yard. This harbour did originally have a dedicated shunter, an 060 tank engine named Wendy. She helped build the harbour in the late 1800s and was owned by the Knapford Harbour Company. She shunted trucks there until 1946. By this time, she was worn out. Instead of repairing her, the harbour company decided to scrap her. Following this, the Northwest Railway shunted the harbour. This duty was handled by the Knapford station pilot. However, in recent years, the combined workload at the station and harbour has become a bit too much for one engine to handle. Next to the main yard, we have a modern addition, a container terminal. This is looked after by Iris, who collects containers and trucks from both the harbour and the yard when needed. She occasionally helps diesel out when the main yard and harbour get busy. She's been having to do this a lot lately. There are two lines into the container terminal. One leads directly into the main yard, and the other leads out to the Knapford Sheds. I'm going to cover the Knapford Sheds in a moment, but first, there's something else I'd like to address. Here, we can see that the line to the Sheds continues past the container yard and curves around behind the Sheds themselves. In the Railway series, this was the line behind the Sheds where Donald and Douglas went down to visit the Varawi engines in the story Ballast. In other words, the junction to the Little Western branch line. But, that's located at Tidmouth, which is further up the main line in the TV series style soda I ended up with. So this line behind the sheds at Knapford didn't have any reason for being there. Now, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was a lot of railway construction going on in Britain. Amongst these were several projects to build things like tunnels to the Isle of Wight and so on. I figured that something similar could have happened on the island of Sodor. Namely, that they would have attempted to build something like a railway ferry to the Isle of Man. Construction on this would have been interrupted by the First World War, but not before they built the ferry docks, storage yards beside them, and a little bit of track on the Isle of Man itself. The Sodor side of this operation was located behind the Knapford Sheds, at the end of this track that goes around behind them. These days, the docks have long since fallen into disrepair, but the storage yard is still in use. Diesel and Iris use it for extra storage space when required. Returning to the sheds, they're pretty much how they were in the TV series. Between Sodor the Early Years and Sodor the Modern Years, they were expanded from 6 to 10 berths. A smaller shed was also built next to them to accommodate Pip and Emma when they joined the Northwest Railway. The lines from the harbour and sheds meet and form the start of the main line just before Knapford Station. 
This station itself is more or less depicted the same as in the TV series, with three through platforms and two bay platforms. Heading down the main line, we next come to East Knapford Station. It was built in 2001 to serve the growing suburbs of Knapford. All non-express mainline passenger trains stop here. Continuing along the main line, we soon reach the junction to the Little Western Branch. This is a Y design, which allows trains from the branch line to join the main line in either direction. On the other side of Tidmouth Station, we have Tidmouth Yard. This has a few double-ended sidings, as well as the Tidmouth Sheds. Originally, there were just three of these for Thomas, Toby and Percy. Following Lily's rescue and restoration, a fourth shed was built on the end to accommodate her. Another thing I inherited from the TV series style layout was this track leading out of Tidmouth Yard, away from the main line. In the past, I usually showed random trains going down it, but now I figured out a proper reason for it to be there. I'll explain this later when I'm talking about the Little Western branch line. Shortly after leaving Tidmouth, the main line passes through Ellsbridge Forest which is one of Henry's favourite parts of the line. At one end is a signal box next to a level crossing. This road leads to a small hamlet, Lower Ellsbridge, which overlooks the railway line. Just behind the signal box is a small picnic area, which is very popular with train spotters. After leaving the forest, the main line continues to Ellsbridge Station. Most of the trains for the Farquhar branch line start here, and there is a small yard to accommodate trucks and coaches for this line. A couple of miles up is the junction to the Farquhar branch itself. This is the last point at which the TV series layout of the stations comes into play. From here on out, the stations along the main line are laid out as per the railway series, more or less. Next up is Crosby Station, which is served by all mainline non-express passenger trains. After Crosby, the next feature of note is the junction to the Brendam branch line. Just beyond this is Bellsworth Station. As well as a small yard, this station also has a small siding, where Edward or Boko will occasionally wait to help heavy trains over Gordons Hill. This brings us to Gordons Hill. Again, I'm using the Sodor Island 3D version of it, which is a good recreation of it as it appears in Season 1 of the TV series. Following this, we have Maron Station. Next along from Maron is Kildane Station, which is the junction with the Peel Godred branch line. This branch is run by four electric engines. This was one of the first routes that I made in trains, and I'll be updating it before you next see it in Sodor the Modern Years. One addition I will be making to this updated route will be the Kildane Ironworks. The yard at Kildane Station is the main junction for trains to and from the ironworks. After Kildane, the next mainline station is Kelsthorpe Road. This is where the Kirk Ronan branch line starts, after it was rebuilt and reopened in the 1980s. It's run by a single engine, Eric. Next up is Croven's Gate. It's one of the more notable stations for two reasons. Firstly, it's the only station where mainline trains meet narrow gauge, as the Scarlowy Railway starts here. Secondly, the steamworks are located opposite the Scarlow Railway Sheds. These were originally part of the Northwest Railway itself. However, in 1996, they were split off into a wholly owned subsidiary company, the Sodor Steamworks. Since then, they've worked with various heritage railways to help restore and preserve steam engines, as well as looking after the Northwest Railway engines. During the Second World War, these works were requisitioned for the war effort, along with most railway workshops on the mainland. A Jinty class locomotive was assigned to the Sodor Works as a dedicated shunter, and he served there until 1967, when he was replaced by a British Rail class 47 diesel named Jeff. As well as shunting the works, Jeff also acts as a rescue engine when trains break down. He was bought by the Steamworks after privatisation, and he still performs these duties to this day. In the present, the Steamworks gets several regular visitors. 
Engines deliver damaged coaches and trucks from their branch lines and take the repaired ones back. As well as this, Ari and Bert make regular runs to collect scrapped parts for the ironworks. These are melted down and recycled into new parts to help keep the trains and vehicles of Sodor running. Continuing along the main line, we reach the junction to the Nirumbi branch line. Just beyond this is the tunnel where once an engine attached to a train was afraid of a few drops of rain. On the other side of the tunnel, we have Vickerstown Station. As well as the station itself, there is also a small yard here and the shed for the Nirumbi branch engines. After Vickerstown, the main line crosses a bridge over the Walney Channel before terminating at Barrow in Furness. Here, the Northwest Railway has sheds and fueling facilities for their engines. That covers the main line. Now, I'll be discussing the branch lines. Returning to Tidmouth, we have both the Little Western and Farquhar branch lines starting here. I'll be covering the Little Western first. As I mentioned previously, there are actually two lines going out of Tidmouth into the Little Western. The first is the Y junction that I mentioned on the main line. This is the main junction for the branch. From this junction, the branch line runs more or less straight into Tidmouth Holt. The second line out of Tidmouth comes off the rear of Tidmouth Yard. It goes around to this small goods yard to the side of Tidmouth Holt Station. Two trucks out of the yard join the branch line just before the station itself. After Tidmouth Holt, the line runs along some cliffs by the coast before reaching the beachside station at Holtro. Continuing from here, the line crosses Dwalgie's Bridge past a cricket field. It then runs beside the beach before turning inland and reaching Callan Station. There is a small yard here. Beyond the station are engine sheds, fuel and water facilities, and a turntable. A track beside the sheds continues the branch line to the final station at Arlesborough. Here, the line meets the sea at Arlesborough Harbour. There is also a small yard next to the tracks for the Vera Wee engines of the Arlesdale Railway. At the moment, the harbour and yard shunting is handled by one of the little western engines, usually Donald or Douglas, as they look after most of the goods traffic along this branch. Tidmouth also acts as the starting point for a few of the services that run along the Farquhar branch line. As such, the engine sheds for Thomas, Percy, Toby and Lily are located within Tidmouth Yard. However, the branch line does not diverge from the main line until after Ellsbridge Station. As such, most of the services for the Farquhar line start and finish here. To this end, there is a small yard at Ellsbridge to hold trucks bound for destinations along the branch line. After leaving the main line, the branch line crosses the river Ells, where a certain blue tank engine once went fishing. It continues past a water mill before reaching Dryor Station. A small airfield is located here, where you'll usually find Harold the helicopter when he's not busy. After leaving Dryor, the line passes a windmill which you may find familiar. It travels through more countryside, then reaches Maithwaite Station. Again, this is a station that was inherited from the TV series, just like what happened with Knapford. Just after Maithwaite, we have a small goods station. Then, the line reaches Torirek Station. It's a small station, but notable due to Daisy's shed being located here. Just after Torrey Rex Station, we have a junction to the old lead mines where Thomas nearly fell down the mine shaft. Continuing along the branch, we have another goods only station at Tysdale. I believe this also comes from the TV series, and I recall seeing this location in one of the season 3 episodes. Next up, the line reaches Hackenbeck Station. This is where Thomas was stopped in the story, The Runaway. The line then runs through the countryside before reaching Farquhar. This is where passenger and general goods services end. However, a line continues past Mavis's crossing to the Farquhar quarry. This is where Mavis does most of her work, although she is allowed down the line every now and then. Before Thomas took over this branch line, it was run by some of the engines from the precursor railways. They usually took turns running this branch line as they were also helping out with other duties on the newly formed Northwest Railway.
Wellsworth is where the Brendan branch diverges from the main line. Shortly after the junction, the line passes Crocs Scrapyard, and then it goes past the Vicarage Orchard where Trevor lives. The line continues along an inlet at the bottom of the island, with the ocean to the east. After a few miles, it reaches Lower Suttery Station. Just beyond this station, a goods line branches off to a small industrial estate and harbour. Continuing down the branch line, we next reach a small goods depot at Upper Suttery. The branch runs through Brendam Yard, where the line to the China Clay Works joins it. It then ends at Brendam Station. Just beyond the station is Brendam Harbour. As I mentioned at the start of this video, it doesn't make sense for this to be THE big harbour for the island, being at the end of this modest branch line. So, this version of Brendam is a more modest harbour, with just a few docks and sheds. It's mostly used for loading China clay, however, some goods does get shipped through here too. From the junction at Brendam Yard, the line to the China clay quarry runs through a section of the line known as the drain. Here, the land dips and it floods easily. After this, the tracks reach the China Clay Quarry itself. The quarry is loosely arranged into three areas. Immediately beyond the entrance are the workings, where China Clay is extracted and put into trucks to be taken away. In the middle of the quarry is a small shed for Bill and Ben, along with a water tower, coal bunkers and a small office. On the other side of these are workshops and storage sheds, as well as some additional locomotive servicing facilities. Next up is the Peel Godred branch line, which meets the main line at Kildane Station. This is the only electric branch line on Sodor, and is run by four Class 87 engines. E5 is Andy, E6 is Jeff, E7 is Sean, and E8 is Steve. After leaving Kildane, the branch line reaches Abbey Station. Next along the line is Kirk Macken Station, where the sheds and start of the Caldy Fell Railway are located. The Kaldi Fell Railway will be appearing in upcoming episodes of Sodor the Modern Years, however, I have not yet had a chance to make the route. I'm planning to have it pretty much as it appears in the railway series, with the scenery inspired by the actual Mount Snowdon Railway. Leaving Kirk Macken, the Peel Godred branch line passes under the Kaldi Fell tracks further up, then it reaches the walled town of Peel Godred. Before reaching the station, the line passes through a tunnel under the town. Emerging on the other side, it meets the miniature engines of the Arlesdale Railway. The miniature railway was extended along the route of the old Mid-Sodor line during the events of Sodor the early years. I'll be talking more about this later. After Peel Godred Station, the branch line terminates at an aluminium plant. The Kirk Ronan branch line is the shortest on Sodor, consisting of only three stations. It was closed down in 1934, during the Great Depression, then restored and reopened half a century later, in 1984. It's run by Eric, an engine who was built at Crovens Gate in 1984 for this branch line. He was built to the design of an LNER V3 tank engine, with some modern refinements. After leaving the junction at Kelsthorpe Road, the branch line climbs through a forest. It then reaches Rolf's castle. From here, it then descends into Kirk Ronan. After passing Kirk Ronan station, the line terminates at the small harbour beside the town. The last standard gauge branch line on the island is the Norrenby branch line. These days, it's run by three diesel engines. Owen, a class 56, handles the goods traffic. Evan and Edwin, the Pacer twins, look after passenger traffic. But, these three only started looking after this line when it was reopened in the mid-1980s. Prior to this, the line was looked after by former Wellsworth and Suttery Railway No. 4, Emily. She was in Norrenby Harbour when it was bombed in 1940, and has not been seen since then. Following this bombing, the harbour was closed. This caused a decrease in traffic along the branch, which saw sporadic service until it was closed under the beaching cuts of 1965. As I mentioned earlier, this branch line starts at Vickerstown and runs west, with the junction diverging from the main line immediately after Henry's Tunnel. It then reaches Balahu, 
after crossing an old stone bridge in the middle of town. From here, it passes the remains of the line to the old Orenby Harbour. This part of the line hasn't been used since the harbour was bombed, except on one occasion. This was when Peter was put into the Balahu Tunnel as part of the Strategic Steam Reserve pilot project. After the junction, the line runs along a cliff. The beach below it is a popular spot with both locals and tourists. The line then curves around the coast and reaches the Norumbi Transport Hub. Here, the trains meet Hubert the Hovercraft, who takes passengers and their cars to the mainland. Originally, the line finished in the small yard just beyond this station. However, when the line was reopened in 1984, it was extended to South Norumbi. In order to get there, it crosses a bridge across the mouth of the Norumbi Cove, within which lies the Norumbi Marina. This is where Ten Cents is currently based, as he's being restored by the Norumbi Maritime Historical Society. After crossing the bridge, the branch line ends at South Norumbi. Although it is a modern station, it still has a turntable next to the goods shed for when steam engines help out along the line. One of the oldest lines on Sodor, the Skarloey Railway runs from Crovens Gate up into the mountains on the eastern side of the island. Cam Jones of the website Crovens Gate Works gave me permission to use and modify his Crovens Gate and Lakeside Loop routes as part of a railway series style route covering this railway. I appreciate Cam's generosity in allowing me to do so. As such, when making this route, I just had to model the bits that would go between the two routes. This route starts at Crovens Gate, where the little trains meet those of the main line. From here, it heads northwest before reaching Krosnai Curran Station. After Krosnai Curran, the line passes Ben Glass, where Sir Handel and George once came to blows. There is a small request stop here, which is used at least twice a week. The line then crosses a creek and goes past a school before arriving at Glenock. After leaving here, the line turns north and starts to climb. After passing through the only tunnel on the railway, the tracks cross a viaduct over a small gully. They then reach Reneus Station. After Reneus, we go from my middle section onto Cam's Lakeside Loop route. As such, the line from here may have a few TV series elements. Originally, one branch of the line here ran to Skarloey Town and the slate quarry near it. The other branch ran to the town of Lakeside. When the rear part of the slate quarry was sold to the Ministry of Defence in 1960, the funds from the sale were used to join the two ends of the line together into the Lakeside Loop. This was completed in 1965 and the loop line opened. Starting at the junction, taking the left branch sees the line follow the banks of the lake. After a short distance, the line starts to climb into the mountains. It soon comes to the old iron bridge where Adeline had her accident and Duncan got spooked. Just after this is a small workman's outpost with a water tower. After this, the tracks pass a caravan park before reaching the edges of Skarloey town. Just before Skarloey Station, a Y junction leads to the Slate Quarry branch. This line runs for a few miles before reaching the Slate Quarry itself. The Ministry of Defence recently decommissioned their facilities in the rear part of the quarry and handed it back to the Skarloey Railway. Even with this part of the quarry back in operation, there is still not much slate going out these days. As such, the Skarloey Railway now mostly brings goods and visitors to the towns along it. Tourists are also a large part of their passenger traffic. Back at Skarloey Station, the main line continues around the lake. Just after the station is a goods station and yard. This acts as the main yard for this end of the line. I believe this location is based on one from the later model eras of the TV series. After leaving Skarloey Yard, the line heads uphill once more. It passes by a picnic spot, which has another request stop for the trains. This is a popular spot for weddings, and the Skarloey Railway does offer wedding train charters. From here, the line winds downhill, again following the shores of the lake. Just after levelling out, it reaches the causeway. This is one of the more iconic parts of the line, and features heavily in the railway's promotional material. After crossing the causeway, the line passes a small nature reserve. 
There is a station here and a few trains are run per day to bring visitors to the reserve. From here, the line runs double tracked until it reaches the town of Lakeside. This is where the line splits. One line goes off to the right, bypassing the station. This is used by trains that are just passing through the town, mostly those carrying goods and slate. After crossing the lake, it runs along the streets for a little bit. The other line runs around from Lakeside Station, the last stop on the line. After leaving the station, trains head through a cutting. They then join the other end of the goods line after crossing a small creek. The line crosses a small stream a bit further down, just before a level crossing. This is where Sir Simon Norrenby stopped Sir Handel from running into a landslide. A short distance later, the line reaches the other branch of the loop junction. From here, trains can just continue back down towards Croven's Gate, having completed a run along the line. Last, but by no means least, we have the smallest engines on Sodor, those of the Arlesdale Railway. Originally opened in 1967, it is a minimum gauge railway which follows the old Mid-Sodor line. It was built to serve several of the same mines as the Mid-Sodor Railway. Their rocks were discovered to be good for railway ballast, as weeds don't grow in them. As well as the steam engines, there are four diesels on this railway. Frank and the Blister Twins help look after and maintain the track and infrastructure. Sigrid of Arlesdale is the mainline diesel. She helps with both passenger and goods traffic. Most of these engines are based in the main sheds at Arlesborough, where the line starts. As well as a station, there's a small yard here and a chute for unloading ballast into the standard gauge trucks. This is also a short distance from Arlesborough Harbour. Unfortunately, the Arlesdale Railway does not have a line into the harbour. So, as I've mentioned previously, goods going from the miniature engines to ships in the harbour need to be loaded into standard gauge wagons and then shunted into the harbour. After leaving Arlesborough, the railway heads up to Bridge Street Station in the middle of Arlesborough Town. There are additional sheds here, which are where Frank and the Blisters usually stay overnight. Sigrid sometimes sleeps here too, if she's not in the main sheds. After leaving Bridge Street, the line heads out of the town and through the countryside. Here, it passes farm fields before reaching Farquhar Road Station. An abandoned line behind the station leads to an old mine, which was once served by the Mid-Sodor Railway. From Farquhar Road, the line continues through more countryside. After crossing the River Arl, a junction leads to one of the reopened mines. The line then reaches Marthwaite Station. It then passes a forest track, where Bert was once splashed by the thin and fat clergyman. The line exits the forest at Arlesdale Green Station. Unlike the others, this station has a few goods sightings. These are used by nearby farmers to send their produce to market. After Arlesdale Green, the line enters Arlesdale itself. Originally, this was where the line ended. However, the line was expanded further along the route of the old Mid-Sodor Railway. In order to facilitate this, a reversing loop was built beyond the station at Arlesdale. Trains traverse this loop before continuing back past the station, then take the junction on the other side of the river. After taking this junction, the line goes past the old Mid-Sodor Railway Sheds. This is where Bert heard Duke calling out while helping with the expansion of the line. No trains stop at this old station, and its platform is overgrown. From here, the terrain changes as the line climbs up into the mountains. Again, it uses the roadbed and tunnels which were originally built for the Mid-Sodor Railway. This reuse allowed the extension to be completed for a reasonable cost. At Kaznai Howen Station, another old section of track leads to another abandoned mine. Unlike the ones further down the valley, the stones here do not have the weed stopping composition that makes them useful for ballast. From here, the line climbs further. At its peak, it passes the spot where Falcon nearly fell into the valley before descending down towards Peel Godred. Just before reaching the town, the line has a station at King Ori's Bridge, which is named after a local historical site. After this, the line finishes at Peel Godred Station, where, as I mentioned earlier, the miniature engines meet the electric ones. So there you have it. That's how the island of Sodor is laid out in Sodor the Early Years and Sodor the Modern Years. 
I hope this clears up a few questions. If you've watched this far, thank you for listening.